And uh, welcome to our afternoon panel. My name is Bob Wood. I'm with AFSIA International. And on behalf of USNI and AFSIA, we'd like to welcome you to this presentation and this panel. I think we've got ceasefire called on the range right now. I think we'll be okay until uh, we end. And it's a great system. If you haven't been over, take a look at it. It's a tremendous system. Uh, we are here today to talk about the subject, how do we leverage information to win in the multi-domain fight? Uh, and in fact, uh, what progress are we making to do that? As uh, the CNO pointed out in his challenge to us, not just pose a rhetorical question, but what are we doing to make progress in order to leverage information? Uh, we've got a stellar panel to talk about that. And in fact, uh, uh, a great moderator as well. I'd like to uh, welcome the panel first, and, but also uh, let me introduce our moderator. We are uh, glad to have uh, uh, a variety of uh, players here on the stage, uh, a lot of them from the Navy and some from the Marine Corps and also the Coast Guard. Uh, they'll be introduced uh, separately after I introduce General Shea. General Shea uh, is our moderator. He is the uh, CEO of AFC International. The he, before that, he was ex the Executive Vice President at Smartronics. He's been the Director of C4 Systems, the J6 at the Joint Staff, Deputy Commander of United States Forces in Japan, uh, a variety of uh, field and operational jobs in the force, in the, in the, in the core, uh, in the joint force, uh, and importantly, he's my boss. So uh, I'm awfully glad to have the opportunity to uh, introduce him. But I can speak from that perspective a little bit. No one's more passionate about information and it's how it's being used, how it's being protected, how it's being leveraged than General Shea. Uh, we have the great opportunity in AFC to visit and, and present and listen to a host of leaders in our military and in the commercial world talk about this subject. So uh, it was a fairly easy ask uh, for me to ask General Shea to moderate this panel. He's got a, a great set of uh, people here on the panel to introduce and a great panel to present. So ladies and gentlemen, again, thank you for being here and I'd like you to welcome our panel. Okay, you, know, you can hear me now, I can tell. Well, thank you uh, for being here today. And the, the topic of this panel, how do we leverage information to win the, the multi-domain fight? Um, this has really become, information has really become recognized as one of the key war fighting enablers. In some cases, it can be the main effort. You know, I think we heard this morning, we've heard earlier in this week that in, we are in phase three right now. Uh, if you look what's going on, uh, and if you're not familiar with that term, the bottom line is we're in a contested environment when it comes to information. And so what we're seeing evolve is uh, now is some concepts on how to better leverage the information we have. Um, we, I don't want to get in a lot of detail on this, but the, the, you know, the president has directed that there be an establishment of a, state, uh, a space command in the United States. Information was designated as a warfighting domain, uh, I think it was about eight years ago by Secretary Gates, and I think the date was May 18th, uh, 2010. So the bottom line is acknowledgement that information has really become a key piece of the global warfight, and I think that's one of the distinctions you can make with information and cyber and space. These are, these are global areas, global domains that we've got to be able to operate in. In some cases, they are enablers, and in some cases, they can be the main fight as we go forward. So uh, the importance of this is really important. A couple of uh, things that are going on right now, um, you can see the Army is, is looking at multi-domain operations. They've come out, and they've given, uh, they're, they're, it's, a, uh, it's a, an evolutionary opportunity that, with them as well as with the, with the uh, Air Force. The real question is what, what is different from what we're doing now and, and how do multi-domain multi operations make the war fight different? And what is the impact of multi-domain operations? So before we get into that, this discussion, and really this is a discussion because this is an evolutionary topic as we, as we move forward. Um, and there's a lot of discussion, a lot of debate that has to go back and forth. And, and how do you how do you develop and maintain and secure 
a network that will tie together all these domains that are out there and at the same time, uh, how does the network serve as a, 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 a capability delivery platform as we go forward? So we're fortunate today to have several people, and, and, and as, I, as you go through the, uh, their biographies, and I'm just going to hit touch on them very briefly, you'll recognize that these people are all professionals in this world that we're talking about right now. They've all distinguished themselves in, in this area of information and, uh, and the ability to move information across domains. I'm not going to spend a lot of time doing the introductions. You can, you can see this for yourself. But I would highlight a couple things from my immediate left is uh, Admiral Chase. He's the Deputy Director for Command Control Communications and uh, Computers and Cyber, the J-6 on the Joint Staff. He's a helicopter pilot by former trade, and he has served as the Deputy Assistant Chief of Staff for Requirements, Innovation, and Experimentation at Third Fleet. He was the Deputy Director for Command Control Communications and Cyber at PACOM and the Chief Staff Chief of Staff for Naval Information Forces. He's, he's had command at multiple levels uh, to include Naval Warfare uh, Command at, and uh, the Naval Communications and Telecommunications, uh, Computer and Telecommunications Station on Guam out in the Pacific. And he's also served as the Information Warfare Commander at Carrier Strike Group 3 with the, with the Stennis Strike Group. So I wish, uh, I want to welcome him to, to our, uh, our panel here. Admiral Dave Dermelian has previously served as the commander of the Coast Guard's Command Control Communication Computers and Information Technology Service Center. Um, he has initiated Project Torchlight to transform from an asset-based organization to a service delivery provider. Um, he also serves the uh, Chief Officer of Office of Cybersecurity and Telecommunications. He was the DAA, he's the guy who had to take on the responsibility for certifying systems as they came on to the, to the CIPRNET and, and the NIPRNET. And he also, interesting, as you get into this information world, he's also served as the head of the delegation to the International Maritime Organization Subcommittee on Radio Communications and Search and Rescue, which oversaw the international policies uh, devolve, in, um, implementations uh, in the global maritime distress safety system. And next to him, we have uh, Vice Admiral Matt Kohler. Matt is uh, commissioned as an intelligence officer, and he got a degree in computer science from Naval Postgraduate School. He, he's had worldwide deployment, deployments supporting combat operations in numerous aircraft carrier strike groups and amphibious ready groups. Um, he's been the chief, uh, served in the Chief Office of Cybersecurity and Telecommunications Policy. He was, I'm sorry, I, I got that one mixed up. Um, I got a back up here. One second. I'm sorry. Matt, I got you out of se sequence here. I'm sorry. Um, That's okay. It's not very distinguished. But anyway. <laughs> I, I will, I will let me say, my time to the right honorable. Uh, yeah, well, I'm sorry. I apologize for, uh, for Matt for that. Um, but the bottom line, currently he is serving as the N2N6 for the United States Navy. Um, on the uh, CNO staff. And next to Matt, we've got Admiral Nancy Norton. Nancy has been involved in this communications field for her entire career. She was the Director of Defense Information Systems Agency, and her current position is also Commander of the Joint Force Headquarters, Doden, uh, that is responsible for the network security that we've got out here. She served in information warfare billets at all levels of float and ashore. And she deploys a security officer of the, on the staffs of the United States Pacific Command and, and, and PAC fleet. And she's had an extensive career, as I said, in, the, in this area. And next is uh, General Lori Reynolds. Uh, Lori has had a, a, a career that has been totally immersed in communications until the latter years where it kind of became broadening. But she, She's been a career communications officer. She's been in a comm company, a Marine Wing Communications Squadron. So she's got a full understanding of what a Marine Air Ground Task Force has and what it's all about. Um, she was commanded 9th Com uh, Communications Battalion in 2003 and deployed the battalion to Fallujah in Iraq. She served on the Joint Staff in the J-6, and she assumed command of one MEF headquarters group in 2009 and deployed with that group uh, to Helmand Province in Afghanistan. 
She's also, as I said, that she had an extensive career uh, early on, but she's also been the commanding general of the Marine Corps Recruit Depot in the dep uh, at uh, Paris Island, South Carolina. I think that's a name that you'd all recognize. She served on the OSD staff, and uh, she's also been the commander of the Marine Corps component of the uh, U.S. Cyber Command, and she is currently serving as the uh, deputy commandant for integration in the Marine Corps. So what I'm going to do to start this thing out is I'm going to ask uh, you know, I'm going to ask um, Admiral uh, um, um, Admiral Chase here to kind of give his perspective on what do multi-domain operations mean um, from a joint perspective, particularly as we are in this uh, embryonic stage, I think perhaps or evolutionary stage of what's going on. Go ahead. So for multi-domain operations really evolves from an army concept that says uh, short of conflict, they'll use a, a layered standoff in the political, military, and economic realms uh, to separate the U.S. from its partners. And then in conflict, it'll also use multi-layer in all domains, and that is uh, defined as land, air, sea, and then adding space and cyber um, to defeat us. And certainly the Army has been rapidly developing this concept, um, looking at force posture, multi-domain functions, and then convergence in, in the sen sense of uh, force application and then synchronization in time. Uh, from a joint perspective, absolutely believe that um, multi-domain operations are necessary and required to win in a great power competition. Uh, the good news is that this concept is kind of lived every day by the naval forces and services um, in the traditional sense from a force posture. Um, Navy, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard have a, a rich history and heritage formed in uh, forward presence, uh, what the Army is calling force posture. Um, second, that forward presence also means you're more likely to bring national technical means to bear. And then third, um, you routinely conduct ops inside of potential adversaries' weapons and sensor ranges. You, you gain an appreciation for what it would take to disrupt, uh, degrade, deny, uh, and, and or defeat those systems. So the challenge there for the force really becomes one of interoperability, um, both among the services and then as we look um, to multinational partners to be able to interoperate with them to be able to deliver from uh, a concept of any sensor to any shooter, making best use of the information environment in that domain to conduct warfare. Now, within, as the general mentioned, um, within the information domain itself for the joint force, uh, competition certainly already exists. We have forces in contact uh, every day. And it's not just in the military realm. That competition already exists in the homeland, uh, the defense industrial base, critical infrastructure. Social media has uh, widely been demonstrated to influence public opinion, sometimes using false or alternative facts. Um, and then bot armies used to, to like or corroborate those, those stories to, to generate overall fake opinions and sway the opinions of others. And then we see cyber used to perform sabotage, espionage, and industrial threat, theft um, at pace. So while the physical domains all run in parallel um, to connect and synchronize, that, that's certainly true, but the information domain also has the ability to run perpendicular in that activity to deliver essentially a backplane um, for all those other domains to be able to deliver key information and data at the right time at the right place for that any sensor to any weapon. So the, I think the name of the game from the joint perspective is for those familiar with Air Force OODA loops to uh, observe, orient, decide, and act. The goal is to speed up hours and to deny, disrupt, and degrade that of the adversary. Um, and those need to be done simultaneously, both in force application, in cyber, and in information operations. Can we hear, uh, you know, the, can we hear the perspective on how well, the Coast Guard sees uh, the multi-domain operations? Right. So. Uh, we can't uh, deploy forces. We can't uh, rely on a lot of the services, especially this, this uh, environment is a great example. Uh, our dependency on, uh, on the commercial sector, uh, our dependency on, uh, on our port partners, especially in the maritime transportation sector where the Coast Guard's the, uh, really uh, focused on, uh, on behalf of the Department of Homeland Security. So the, the notion of being able to partner uh, in that multi-domain environment with, uh, with non-government organizations is key to uh, keep that $4.6 trillion of goods and services flowing throughout our maritime uh, transportation system. 
So the, uh, the notion of being able to, uh, to do that um, is, is not easy because we don't compel compliance to share information with our non-government organizations. So it really comes down to a, uh, a willingness for our, uh, our commercial sector partners to, uh, to understand the, the value of uh, what would hurt one would hurt all. Um, and so I think in the financial sector, they've done that very well uh, with sharing information, especially in the cyber domain with the information sharing analysis centers. Um, I think the also there's a there's a there's each port, each of the uh, nation's 58 critical ports has a uh, has an area maritime uh, security committee that's focused on how uh, multi-domain on the surface air uh, cyber for sure, as well as land. Uh, how we protect those ports uh, so that we can continue to see the commerce flow in and out uh, of those areas. So that's a, that's a huge challenge for each of those captain of the ports, which come with rather broad authorities. Um, and so that's a coalition of the willing. Okay, thank you. Admiral Kohler, uh, can you kind of give the, you know, from a Navy perspective, how you see multi-domain operations, please? Yeah, happy to. Um, one, one, thanks for the opportunity to be here today. Uh, thanks, everyone, for, for being here. Uh, Emil Norton and I were, were chatting uh, just before we kicked off this event, and we were commenting that, you know, you've been around a long time when, when you know just about everybody in the audience. Uh, uh, while we were chuckling, I think it's, frankly, a real strength. So... Um, so thanks, hope that we can uh, have a good exchange here this afternoon. Uh, having made the comment about being around a long time, I, I, I find myself increasingly in different groups. I was, I was uh, uh, in Boston uh, to meet a, a couple of events and I, I crashed a Navy ROTC event at a local eatery and, uh, and I said, well, hey, if, well, you know, they're all Navy. And I said, I'm Navy too. Uh, and they said, well, how long ago did you retire? <laughs> I said, well, okay, thanks, about time for me to moving on. So, uh, um, so hopefully many of you had a chance to hear from the Chief of Naval Operations during the lunch on the first day of the event here. Um, and he talked uh, a lot about what we would talk about today from a Navy perspective, because he is all about, uh, in, about the power of information in terms of how it manifests itself in Navy warfighting today. And it's all through his design for maintaining maritime superiority, uh, version 2.0. It's what he talked about in his session. Um, he highlighted in there, in one of his slides, is essentially one of a key figure in the design 2.0 document where he talks about the spectrum of rivalry, the, uh, the arrow across the top, the classical day-to-day -day operations, rising tensions up to the spectrum of a, a high-end intensity kinetic kind of conflict. Um, and then below that, there was, you know, a, an arrow that had information warfare that underscored all of it. Uh, so that's the Navy. All of our forces uh, are directed by law you know, to, to be prepared uh, to, to acquire what we need, to field what we need, to train to a level what we need for the high-end conflict that we need to be ready for. Um, all of that has, certainly from a Navy perspective, information warfare all through it and it's highlighted even in that diagram, the expectations that we're gonna fight in a contested environment, um, an information contested environment, electromagnetic maneuver warfare, the ISR counter ISR fight, uh, really whoever wins that aspect of the fight is gonna be successful. Uh, but the arrow in the information warfare extended all the way to the left, and frankly, we're spending the vast majority of our time not in armed conflict, um, and, and where do we define winning in that spectrum? Uh, and as highlighted here is we consider ourselves an information warfare perspective in contact every day. I don't need to highlight for Alan Norton who has the, the tough job of running the Doden uh, on, on how many type of you know, probes and activities that, that she has to battle with each day. Um, and that clearly is a multi-domain fight. One aspect on the multi-domain fight that I'll highlight though, if you look in, in design 2.0, I got a number of specific tasks in that. Uh, one started with a discussion called the Naval Tactical Grid, uh, the Navy Tactical Grid. And it was all about the, the recognition that how we fight um, uh, in our distributed maritime operations fight is, is, is dependent upon how well we are, that we can network ourselves together, not just from an IP network. It's our links, our data links. It's our RF communications, everything that brings 
um, everything together in a fight that makes this work better. But clearly we moved rapidly away from the Navy tactical grid to define it as the naval tactical grid, working closely with our marine partners in terms of what we need to do. And then we moved beyond that quickly to in a matter of hours saying, hey, it's really a joint tactical grid. Uh, we have established a, a charter with all of the services uh, to move ahead collectively in how we define how we interoperate together in, in that kind of technology. So um, I, I, in, in terms of a multi-domain fight, in terms of a multi-service fight, uh, what we have learned over the last 20 years uh, of fighting in a, in a mainly land-centric uh, war fight is, is doubling down in this area of great competition. Uh, now more than ever, no service is going to go it alone. Uh, and I think everyone recognizes going forward it's going to be a joint fight. Thank you. So Admiral Norton, um, you've got the backbone for the warfighting community, your combat support organization. How does multi-domain operations play into what you have to do as that provider? Yes, sir. So uh, as you said, uh, DISA is a combat support agency, and, and in that we support every one of the combatant commands in uh, every domain, and so that role has been a multi-domain role from, from the beginning. Uh, the more that that, uh, that, that multi-domain um, fight is done in a uh, concerted manner, and um, with the joint force, the, the more complex and the more important it is that, uh, that DISA's role is feeding into being able to, uh, to do that role supporting uh, combat operations. And so we're, we're part of that from the very beginning in supporting of the DOD CIO and the role in uh, developing the architecture and the standards that have to be put in place for the services to, to develop or for DISA to develop the services and systems that, uh, that, that are going to be deployed. Um, much of those are the enterprise services that provide the backbone or the services that, uh, that are used um, across uh, all of the military services and the agencies across the 43 uh, DOD components. Uh, but we also play a role in the day-to-day -day operations of the DISN backbone and, and all of the communications flow that has to happen over that backbone, as well as the, the really important uh, interoperability testing that we do through JITIC that supports, again, all of the, the uh, DOD components and uh, making sure that as we develop those systems in um, one domain for one service, that those are not uniquely able to operate in just that domain and just that service, but in fact able to operate in a, a uh, multi-domain um, joint fight and coalition fight, because that's a big part of what we do as well, is making sure that, that we can operate um, with our coalition forces. So, um, so all the way through the testing and then the day-to-day -day operations and the secure and defend missions that we have both with DISA and with the Joint Force Headquarters Doden of making sure that um, that, that contact that Admiral Kohler talked about, that we are in uh, every day hand-to-hand -hand combat contact with the adversaries in the cyber domain every single day. Um, you know, we're, we are facing uh, one and a half billion cyber events that we're dealing with every day across the Doden. And, uh, and so that um, is not an addition on top of the other domains, but is absolutely integral to how we operate, we, the DOD um, Joint and Coalition Forces, operate in every domain of warfare every single day. We cannot operate uh, in any domain without the cyber domain and the space domain uh, anymore. We just can't. You know, we, we have uh, grown to a point where our effectiveness depends on our ability to operate in the cyber domain. And so that, that multi-domain integration is intimately uh, integrated in a way that it never was, certainly not, uh, you know, when we came into the, to the service some decades ago, uh, we, we can't operate that way anymore. And so we have to think about uh, how each one of those domains play together for our strengths and uh, that we're able to use that to our advantage against our adversaries. General Reynolds, could you kind of give us a perspective from the Marine Corps, please? Sure, sure. Thank you, and uh, thanks for the invitation to be here. And uh, um, 
talk about this a little bit. I think if I was to write a book about the information fight that we have ahead of us, I would call it uh, Kill Chains and OODA Loops. Because at the end of the day, what it is that we're trying to do is understand the adversaries kill chains and fracture them wherever we can and to strengthen our own kill chains. And the same is true, and Bill Chase uh, talked about this a little bit earlier, about the OODA loop, so that the, the way that we think uh, about um, our own fight and the adversary's thought process in the cognitive space, right? So shortening our ability to make good decisions, but lengthening our adversary's ability uh, to make. So anywhere we can, using whatever tools are available to us, lengthening our adversary's decision-making capability. And that's really what it is that we're trying to do in this, uh, in the information fight. So as you add that to the other domains of warfare, um, that's, you know, the, it's the integration of all of those together um, that, that gets you the sweet spot. Now, you know, Admiral Kohler has already said, in the information fight, the war has already begun, right? So, so um, uh, Admiral Norton and her team are defending aggressively every day, as, as are all of us who run networks. But, um, you know, as we think about the integration of space and cyber with the other domains of warfare, there's a lot of work that we have to get after, right? And there are some believers and there's some non-believers about the preeminence of information. But data, I think most will understand, data is the currency of the next fight, right? Whether it's data for uh, fires, data for logistics, data for command and control, it doesn't matter, it's about data. And so um, the way that we are looking at that in the Marine Corps is number one, my first priority as a Deputy Commandant for Information is to produce a network that we can all be proud of and that's going to enable that next fight. So it's moving from, you know, 71 data centers around the Marine Corps to one or the cloud or edge clouds or cl whatever, that cloud, that data. It's about where is my data, which data matters, and can I get to it when I need it? And all that goes into that, the transport, the applications. The, so thinking about how we design our networks, not based on you know, who your boss is, but what the war fading functions are and the data to enable that. So building that network is challenge number one. And for us in the Marine Corps, it's all about are we even organized in the right way, whether it's a, about concept development, to acquisition, to execution, are we even organized to fight that fight? And that's some of the work that we're doing. The second thing that we are doing right now is, is to put out in the operational forces through the MEF information groups, the teams that can think about those kill chains using uh, tools like space, electronic warfare, um, cyberspace, intelligence, new forms of intelligence, OSINT, other things that are available that we just got to get after, human in cyberspace, things like that. Um, and then uh, a new workforce for communications that can just communicate anywhere. And so um, how do you integrate that, uh, um, again, across the spectrum of you know, fires, logistics, and so forth, and present to the commander a, a, a plan that is going to assure him the ability to command and control. Our commandant is, says all the time that our center of gravity in the Marine Corps, no matter where we go and what we do, is our ability to command and control. So when you think about a Pacific fight and having to distribute that force, the coin of the realm is going to be command and control and, and really logistics. And so as we think about providing that network and those information fires to enable that fight to assure command and control, that's the challenge that I've got. Um, but that's the way we're thinking through that. So look forward to the discussion. So the networks we've got today, were, you know, no one in their right mind would design the infrastructure that we've got. I mean, the CIPRNet was originally designed to support about 1,000 GCS computers, uh, GCCS computers back in, in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, to be able to move quickly across domains, it seems that you've got to have a network that is and I use the term loosely, relatively seamlessly, so you don't have to deal with latency issues. You don't have to worry about uh, being um, disconnected and, or, 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 or the resiliency built in. 
what, what are the characteristics that you would look for in a network that is a, a multi-domain network? What, what is it you'd be looking for to make sure that, number one, you can, you can get that kill chain to the point that you really want it in what would be a multi-environment world where you may be in an urban environment one time, you may be in jungle another time, you may be in the hills another time or the plains. What are some of the characteristics that you would like to see uh, in the network that would support multi-domain operations um, in the world that we're going to have to potentially fight in in the future? You want to take that one on and start with that, Admiral Norton? I'll start with that one. So um, as you know, the, the internet started with the ARPANET. And uh, there was nothing in the ARPANET that was um, designed in a way that, that anticipated the kind of needs that we would have in a warfighting network today. Uh, that was a bunch of research scientists that trusted each other, knew each other, knew where they were, and had protocols to share data uh, you know, in, a, in what, what they considered rapidly at the time. That is not the environment that the internet is today. It's not the environment that we would want for our warfighting networks because um, we, we don't have that kind of, of same level of understanding known um, entities and trust in our networks today. So uh, we need, we need a significantly different approach in terms of the, the uh, trust in our data our, uh, General Reynolds talked about how important the data is and, and being able to have the, the kind of identity management that, that gets down to, I know who you are and I know what you should be getting access to and I know what you should be doing on our network and you shouldn't be doing anything beyond that. And that's just fundamentally not the kind of approach that we've taken to building out the networks that we, uh, that we rely on so heavily today. So, um, so, you know, if you could completely start over, you would start from a, uh, a, a, a concept of um, denial and allow by exception to just the, the specific requirements that an individual needs based on their, their uh, identity, and their specific requirements in the role that they have um, today. And the network itself would be um, much more resilient and self-healing, and um, the, the latency that you talked about would not be an issue because as we start to increase the requirements to move data from the edge to uh, a cloud environment or moving data around from ISR to targeting and back and forth between warfighting and uh, head, higher headquarters for C2 and logistics, you have to have the kind of speed that we expect in order to be able to, uh, to, to beat the adversary. And that's not the network that, uh, you know, that we've grown up with, that we've stitched together over many, many years. And, um, and in, in many ways just really kludged that network together. And so we wound up with, with uh, almost a lowest common denominator of what the requirements are for our network in order to make it function. And, and that's not the way to secure a network, to have the lowest common denom de denominator. You have to have uh, the best possible security and resiliency and the, the lowest uh, latency possible in our network. Someone else like to comment on that? Sure, I'll take a shot at it. Um, I think, you know, the, some of the work that we've been thinking about in the Marine Corps is, um, you know, as you think about the network that you're going to need in this next fight, uh, or, you know, in the environment that we find ourselves in today, I think it's fundamentally different how you plan your way through that, right? So growing up in the Marine Corps, it's all about, you know, who's your boss, and that's, he gets the biggest bandwidth, you know. Um, and I don't think, I don't know that we can do that anymore. Um, I, think, I think the process we have to go through now, and, and one of the things that we started to do in the Marine Corps is, what are our information exchange requirements at that, you know, at that worker B level, at that expeditionary advanced base level? What are the applications that service that information exchange requirement? What is that data? Where does that data need to be? And then where does the transport to enable all of that? That is a fundamentally different way of thinking about designing your network, but that is kind of the work that we're going through right now. So, 
you know, coming out of, you know, however many years we've been out in the desert trying to, so, so I can't, think about giving three stacks to an infantry battalion commander anymore, nip or sip or centrics and whatever the flavor of the day is. You just, that's not the next fight. Um, and so fundamentally, we just have to rethink, you know, starting with what those information exchange requirements are in a, den in a denied or contested environment. Um, how do we make sure while we're doing that, we, we can talk with our allies and partners um, because we can't fight without them in this information fight. Um, you know, and so I think that's really going to drive a different way. And, and of course, wrapped in identity management and security so that, you know, you're protecting life and limb. So that's kind of some of the thinking that we've been doing uh, in the Marine Corps. Yeah, I'll, I'll add to the, uh, uh, some of the comments here made already. Uh, again, I'll reference the design 2.0. My CNO is interested, and I'm fascinated by uh, what his interest is. Uh, and it's another task in there that says, you know, advance our networks. Um, I, I couldn't agree more with both the comments made here. The, what's, the, the things between what has been our traditional enterprise networks down to a tactical level, to a tactical grid, is, is starting to diminish. It's about the data and moving it where it needs to be. We've got a ways to go. But we are on this journey, right? And we had built up, certainly from a Navy perspective, you know, a, a security around, a defense in depth kind of approach uh, that has worked okay for us, but um, that probably is not gonna be able to take us much further. And so we are certainly partnering with DISA uh, on this approach of what it looks like in terms of more of a zero trust approach to an uh, approach to networks in terms of um, making you know, the internal part of the networks to make sure it is much more secure. Uh, because I think that's where we probably had a lot of work to do. Um, I can tell you where the clear path where we're moving ahead for Navy in terms of, of uh, delivering capability faster within our networks. Uh, unfortunately, right now, uh, your Admiral Barrett, I think, has a speaking event on this topic uh, at the same time on our compiled to combat. Uh, all of the services, I believe, are moving towards the cloud. Navy has its, you know, its strategy to move to the cloud initiative. Uh, it's going to not be with its own uh, vulnerabilities, but it's a place for us where we can move and operate and integrate faster. Uh, we have to decompose the hardware from the software in terms of any of the solutions that we're delivering now. It moves way too slowly. We need to be able to spin up our hardware fast as we need it to be to give us the capacity. If that's at the, at the leading edge, we need to be able to do it faster. If it's somewhere else back in the architecture, we need to have a hardware delivered as a service. Uh, being able to deliver applications, getting that, uh, if you saw Secretary Gertz, it was all about getting that kind of capability into the hands of those that will be fighting, in the hands of our sailors. Be able to develop applications, getting them certified, developing them inside a cloud environment, meeting the framework of, of prior existing, prior approved security standards and getting that capability out faster. Uh, that's getting inside the OODA loops that we're talking about that's, that's going to get out ahead of a decision process of our adversaries. And, uh, the Navy is on a deliberate path on, on moving our capabilities uh, quickly to that type of environment. Some will get there faster than others, uh, but that is a dedicated path that we are on. Anybody else? Certainly. The uh, most recent NDAA charged uh, DOD CIO with developing, adopting, or publishing standards for all IT or cyber capabilities for all the services and DOD agencies. And then subsequent to that, the COIO, Mr. DZ, and General Chueda, the Joint Staff J6, were talking, and they had just both recently seen the draft uh, Joint Tactical Grid uh, document signed out to be signed out by the, uh, the service chiefs. Also, they had seen a memo from uh, the service secretaries on acquisition and adopting open standards. And they said, how do we get to do this in our standards so that these two memos shouldn't have to be necessary, they should be automatic, we should always be thinking about it in, in those sort of terms. And in, and in fact, General Schweda was supposed to be here today. Um, he remained behind in the Pentagon to work with Mr. Deasy and a number of the other principals to, to get after doing just that to help out with joint war fighting standards to make sure whatever those standards uh, are adopted, and many of them already exist, so for, for our industry friends, don't, don't freak out. We're not going to try and roll our own because they're, they're specifically charged with you know, a adopting or adapting and claiming this is our standard, not, not rolling our own. Uh, but to stay behind and figure out a framework for how do we take those and adapt them to the individual service environments and agency requirements so that they are 
true standards and not just ad hoc so that we don't have everyone racing to get to what they need first and then finding out they're not interoperable. So a lot of work to be done, uh, but at least we, they're off to a good start and recognizing the problem. Okay, anything else? Before we go to questions, I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw one more out there. Um, I'll take questions from the audience, so if you'd be thinking about them, to questions you may wanna ask the panel. Um, in my mind, when we're thinking about multi-domain operations, we're not just thinking about the Department of Defense. I think we've gotta think about Homeland Security, Commerce, all these other elements of government. What's, what's the forcing function to bring all, all this together? Because in some ways, whether it's Homeland Security, uh, Commerce, whether it's the Coast Guard and their role in, in both, with a foot in both, uh, both ten, uh, courts, What's, what's the function or you know, what is the forcing function that brings this together to make it a, a total government effort? Because it's more than, particularly when you're dealing with the information domain, it's more than just head-on-head uh, -head in conflict. And it's more than just the Department of Defense. Uh, and I'd, I'd like to highlight an exercise that just came out uh, or well, it was done last year, but uh, there was a follow-on to it, an exercise last week called Jack Voltaic, where there was a, a, a weather incident, a, a hurricane in Houston. There was a cyber event that was tied to it because it provided a great opportunity, and there was a need to get, um, get forces deployed at the same time. Uh, the port shut down. The grid shut down, the hospital system was shut down because of, of the combined hurricane event and the effects of weather. First responders were closed out and it was, it was a, a challenge to get forces moved to the port for deployment. So is there a forcing function or something going on right now? And I'm just talking about this, Jack will take at a very high level, but is there something that brings the Department of Defense and the rest, together, or, and the rest of the government together in this information domain that we're talking about? So Joint Staff in conjunction with OSD Policy have, have met uh, several times in the last nine months, say, uh, to work on interoperability and looking at the cyber realm uh, from everything from election security to uh, the financial sector, critical infrastructure sector. So financial, energy, and uh, commerce are the first three that are being looked at and in various stages. And those are all still in the crawl stage, uh, but trying to find out you know, where we can, in, in the event of a, a homeland is no longer a sanctuary. So in the event of a major uh, evolution, what could uh, DOD be, bring to bear um, that would be useful, timely, and what's the status of what's needed, how do we have the process worked out. Um, defense support to civil authorities has existed quite a bit and in pre other domains, but in cyber and others uh, in the information spectrum, it's, it's less um, well done. So exercising those things has, has taken place already. Um, joint staff has said that all uh, joint exercises must now have a cyber component to them. And then finally, the uh, no more white cards has been directed on any of those cyber events. So. Uh, life's about to get a little more challenging in all the exercise realms for sure. Okay, thank you. Anybody else want to come in? On yeah, so I'll, I'll just uh, remind everybody uh, the obvious. Uh, last September we had a cyber attack here in uh, San Diego. And uh, I think the, the, the forcing function is the, uh, is the reality of, of today's information world. So we're going to have events that, that occur. So we need that unity of effort. Uh, the, the unity of effort we saw very successfully executed for the election cam campaign and making sure we had free and clear elections. That was uh, uh, very squarely in, in Department of Homeland Security's uh, uh, bailiwick. Um, however, uh, it was a whole of government effort down to the local state level. Uh, and our DOD brethren were doing what they do in terms of defending forward, right? So all those things, the unity of effort, the clarity of that event, so understanding roles is extremely important. So during the uh, cyber attack uh, from last September, you know, you've, got the, you've got the Department of Justice 
who's uh, exercising their authorities through the FBI for uh, attribution uh, and the investigation and ultimately the, uh, the arrest and the prosecution of the criminals who, who did that. You've got the DHS and, uh, to protect the, uh, the assets and the critical infrastructure. And then you have, uh, they have uh, big DOD uh, and the uh, uh, DNI to understand what the indicators and warnings are left of click so that we can get out in front of that event before uh, it has mass casualties. So I think there's clarity in terms of uh, the forcing function is that uh, the world's uh, is, uh, you know, events are gonna happen. We saw it with Marsk, Marsk uh, back in June of uh, 17, I think 18, 17. Um, catastrophic uh, event worldwide. Uh, and so those are gonna force us to have that clarity of action. Anyone else? Okay, Admiral Mackey. <clears throat> uh, to kind of add to that last one, I would take it from beyond whole of government to whole. To, I think it's a it's across the entire spectrum that uh, that we have, not just the government. <clears throat> I'm old and cantankerous, and so I'll pr apologize up front. I've heard a lot about command and control. I had a PAC fleet commander ask me how how do I ensure that I will have command and control when the war starts. I said, the answer is simple. You build a network, you never turn it on. When the war starts, you turn it on, I'll give you 12 hours. I don't think we will have, in an in a all-out war, command and control from the National Command Authority through the combatant commander down to the unit level. Uh, I'd like to hear your comments on that. I'll, uh, I'll start, sir. It's a uh, um, highly informed observation and question. Um, I, I think what it's all about is, is do I think we're going to have uh, robust, continuous communications all up in the chain? No, I think it's going to be challenged. Um, I, I think uh, in the last five years alone, I think there's been uh, significant progress, not just recognizing it, but, but uh, building an approach on our networks that has a more robust flavor to it. And I think we've um, been training to that level um, in, a, in a comms contested environment and with some elements of the force expecting to operate uh, without them. So um, I, I think the uh, fleet commanders are operating under that, uh, that prospect. But uh, though we are training to be able to operate in a worst case scenario because we should and it's prudent, um, it is all about fighting through it. It is absolutely the approach. Um, it, is, it is more than the philosophy. It is the tools and the training and what we're certifying to op for forces to operate to. Um, some of this is, uh, was, is in the DNA from the Navy a long time ago when we were in a Cold War and our, and our adversary was the Soviet Navy. We trained in that environment then too. It's, it's getting us back into that type of cultural mindset that uh, we know it'll be challenged, um, but we expect to fight through it. Speak yeah, I think, I think the key is we're not talking about assured communications. We're talking about assured command and control. And oftentimes that means mission command. That means having trained your forces to understand what that C2 means in a degraded environment and and being very confident in your warfighting ability in a degraded communications environment. And, and that requires training your forces that way. That, you know, you cannot, so that's the reason why Admiral Chase said uh, there's, there's been a declaration that we won't be doing white cards anymore because oftentimes when we do that, it makes it very easy for the forces to pretend like, okay, well, even though uh, we said there's gonna be a communications outage, it's not gonna impact the, the ex exercise, the operation, you know, how we do business. Well, if it doesn't impact how you do business, then you're not learning how to fight in a contested environment. And, and so you've got to learn. We have to push ourselves to train our forces in a mission command kind of environment. I, th I think, Admiral, you know, please keep, please keep saying these things, um, because you you framed the problem correctly, right? And so, what you don't often see is the urgency um, 
associated with solving that problem and the culture change that we have to get after to fix it. Um, be, so I'll leave it at that. Hi, Justin Katzen, Head Defense. So um, all of you are tasked with defending DOD's networks, which uh, compared to industry's networks, that's a lot easier because you know everything you need to know about DOD's networks. So I'm wondering, how are you thinking about you know, this whole idea of multi-domain fighting and, and cyber in particular when it comes to industry and working with industry? And I guess my, an example of this is uh, some months to a year ago, uh, a Navy subsurface R&D vessel, the subcontractor for that vessel, their system was breached and some very sensitive information got out to places that it shouldn't have gotten out from. So I'm wondering how all of you are thinking about, you know, what is DOD going to do about networks that it, it's concerned about, but it doesn't necessarily have as much oversight over? Okay. I, I'll, I'll take a, uh, a stab at that. So uh, one, thank you that you think our job is easier than industry. Uh, I'll, I'll take that. Uh, please don't cut my pay. Um, so, um, Sir, that's okay. We've already done that. You can survive <laughs> that. <laughs> Well done. Um, so when we talk about cybersecurity um, and securing our information, and let me let me put that in a broader context. You know, we talk about this great power competition. Uh, it, it's almost become a bumper sticker now. You know, uh, and what does it really mean to us? Uh, it means to, back to Admiral Mackey's question, and I think Admiral Norton's response was. You know, th that's an aspect of what this means to get back in great power competition. It's being the expectation that you have to train to a standard that you know that's not going to exist. We talk about cybersecurity. It's, uh, it's security of the information, and it's wherever the information resides. Uh, that could be within our service networks, um, but it's also in those that do business with us. And if we are to stay out ahead in this great power competition, and it's clear from the national defense strategy and certainly what we're seeing in, in uh, other documentation is, is that our technological edge is eroding uh, in this great power competition. Part of what's not helping, uh, certainly the, tech, the rate and pace of technological uh, development and adoption is what really is, is, is turning the heat up under this. But it doesn't help when you know, we're, we're experiencing this greatest theft of intellectual property uh, in world history. Uh, in terms of our adversaries gaining, uh, you know, a, a ground on a, our technological advantage just from, from the theft of information. So um, uh, I, I won't comment on, on any uh, thefts that might have occurred in the past, any specific ones, but certainly from a Navy perspective, um, we consider that vital part of our competition and those that are doing business with us, especially in our critical industries, we have been on a, a, a dedicated path to ensure that those standards are very clear uh, and essentially that the standards in a cybersecurity sense are being raised, the bar is being raised for those that um, are working in critical industries for us to ensure that that information is protected to the standards that it needs to be. Uh, we have been working very closely with Secretary Gertz and his, R his RDA uh, organization uh, partnering with industry uh, and it's been a very positive dialogue. Uh, there is clear-eyed recognition across all our partners that uh, the information that we have is vital. It's a crit critical part of this great power competition, and, and collectively, we have to raise the standards. If one a aspect of this partnership raises the standards, any others doesn't, it doesn't work. And so uh, that's a path that we've been on. Okay. Um, don't walk out of here wishing you'd ask the question because you've got the experts up here right now. Bob? I'd like to move it from information to data uh, and uh, the currency of really this from everything from AI to the understanding of our information. Um, how are we, do we have a sense of urgency about securing data, organizing data, managing data uh, across uh, the joint force, and I'd like to direct that, that question to Admiral Chase. What's the joint perspective on data security, data management, and how it's a war fighting either weakness or advantage? So if we 
kind of merge a little bit of the last two questions. I, I appreciate the thought that uh, all DOD networks are, are well understood, but refer back to Admiral Norton's comments about uh, you know, how it all grew up. The DOD networks were the same. I think across all the services, we still find uh, pockets of, holy cow, we have that. Um, you know, enumerating our networks is still one of our challenges. I think that we can safely say that. Um, but when you look at uh, taking a chapter out of uh, the general's book she intends to publish on kill chains, if you look at you know, where you get it to where you need it, the part that needs to move is the data. It's not everything. It's not the application. So the efforts like compile to combat, I think, show you know, the urgency that's, that's out there. And that's really in all the services, too. And when we go back to the standards, how do we move that data? We see this in our coalition networks, the information exchange requirements. Um, don't move everything. Don't suck up trying to take everything back from the tactical unit and take it all the way back to, you know, ultimately Cybercom to analyze it. Uh, the need to, to see your data and hold on to it and have it close in denied environments becomes paramount. So we can't afford to take it all with us, though. Um, you know, try and pack for a long trip. You just can't. There is a limit to what everybody wants versus what you can actually manage to pack away. Uh, so I think that, that that's our bigger challenge is calling through it, and it's going to take a little bit of time um, because of the way that the networks were, were grown. But the urgency is there. We do see it. Um, all the COCOMs certainly see it. There's, there's never an end to the thirst of, you know, they want more, but at some point we have to get toward uh, what the chairman's been tasked with of, you know, global integration means what do you do when the demand exceeds what we have available to it. So that's a dialogue that we're seeing right now in, in the authorities that the chairman has, and we're seeing it across all the COCOMs and the services as the force providers are, are keenly interested in, in whittling that down as well. But Mike? I, Anybody? Just, oh, just one more thought on that, though. I, I think that, you know, opportunities like the Joint AI Center and um, um, really the imperative to move to the cloud is, is, is forcing all of us to understand better exactly which data matters and what doesn't matter. And so even organizationally, um, you know, how do you organize for data? I mean, this is, these are just those fundamental, like, we, we're not organized for this just yet. Um, um, so, and I think some of the other services are probably ahead of where we are in the Marine Corps, but I, but I think you know, opportunities like AI are forcing us to move more quickly, to organize, understand, properly tag, um, and so that's the hard work ahead of us. I will say this, you know, there's some, there's some pretty fundamental challenges that we have, and, and one of them is, you know, a workforce that really understands how to do this. And so um, taking opportunities like, you know, artificial intelligence and machine learning and, you know, have we trained our people to understand how to do this? Um, so th those are just the building blocks that are absolutely essential for us to be able to move fast. And that's some of the hard work that's not even sexy and it won't be a chapter in the book, but it has to be done. And, um, and you know, we're, Maybe we're trying to tackle some of those things. Yeah. Afternoon, sir. Thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for sharing with us. Uh, in the multi, Mike Fallon, uh, general dynamics. In the multi-domain fight, I would posit that uh, we're in phase zero on the kinetic side and we're probably in phase three right now in the information side. Um, I want to follow on uh, fellow industry question here. Uh, if the attack goes against the commercial networks, which you all ride on anyway, if we be honest about it, I'd like to hear your thoughts about the rules of engagement and how flexible you are on getting after defending the commercial networks or taking down the person going after our really strategic backbone, which is our commercial network that the data goes around the world on. So rules of engagement, flexibility is my underpinning, maybe Admiral Norton, but anybody. Thank you. Yeah. Well, first, I'll reaffirm that we are in phase three in, uh, in, in cyber domain today. There's no question about that in my mind. Um, like I said, we are, you know, we very definitely are in con contact with adversaries, uh, not always knowing who that adversary is in the cyber domain, but certainly that, uh, that there are those who are trying to attack our networks, whether that is our defense networks or uh, the, the contractor networks or the commercial 
uh, aspects of the network that we ride on. Um, we, uh, we, we clearly have all of the authority that we need in terms of protecting the networks that we, um, that we own or that we contract for. And we have a concerted effort to make sure that we are writing good contracts for any, anything that we are uh, contracting our data out for, such as in the cloud. Um, we, uh, under US Cyber Command, have a, uh, a, a cyber strategy for defending forward in, in making sure that we actually understand what's happening in that gray space in, in our networks and are um, actively engaged and prepared to respond to, uh, to the kinds of activity that we see on the commercial networks. Anybody else? Well, let me ask, uh, circle back here a little, a little bit if I could. Um, we kind of touched on it, but as we look to the future to build the next network and we recognize the importance of speed, we recognize the importance of resilience, the importance of being able to defend the network um, and we recognize uh, the importance of low latency to be able to respond or to do the things that we need to do when we're tipping and queuing across services in many cases. Should we be looking to build a, a something that a, a network that it approaches being homogeneous, that has got as few seams in it as possible, or are we looking for something that puts us a little bit more uh, on the defensive piece of this, which is kind of more, I don't want to say kludged together, but certainly doesn't have, uh, but certainly is not seamless by any stretch of the imagination, where you can compartment it to some, uh, just like in a ship, if it was, uh, if you had problems on a ship. So what do you think, the, going forward, what do you think the, uh, the best approach is so that I, I know that, uh, you know, if I'm an Army unit, I, I know that I'm going to be able to get uh, air support or tip and cue an aircraft just like that uh, as opposed to maybe having to go through something as kludge, particularly if milliseconds come into play at some point in time, ballistic missile defense or uh, incoming attack on, on, a, on a deployed force. Any thoughts on that? Well, I, I uh, take and collectively some of the comments that have already been and points that have been made here. You know, if we have the network where we are today, uh, if we were to start from zero and and uh, and move out from here, uh, to meet the the requirements you're stating, which are valid, uh, low latency uh, data delivery um, is anything that inhibits that kind of delivery at speed and a low latency. Um, is uh, uh, incompatible data standards, uh, in, um, incompatible interfaces. Um, every time you have to wrap data into some other type of uh, outer format for it to be transported and compatible to the device, it's time lost. Um, so it is a complete end-to-end -end type of, of work that says, hey, a common data standard, that's a long stretch for all of us to get there. Common set of data interfaces, I think we're on a long, slow journey if we include not just across the joint, but with our international partners, what that looks like. Um, those are key elements that need to get after. I, I think those are recognized long-range goals. We've got a long way to go, even within our own services and the programs that we're delivering, let alone across a joint and a partner uh, uh, kind of perspective. But when we are getting at this joint tactical grid, um, those are some of the issues that we're talking about. Uh, common data standards, common interface standards, those kind of things that allow the data to flow much more uh, cleanly and uninhibited by extra processing to, to standardize that. I'll, I'll offer, um, we're, we're not gonna change the fact that we go 23,000 miles up, 23,000 miles down in a bent pipe to get to remote regions in the ocean. Arctic is a great example where we don't have very good global uh, capability, uh, no one does. Um, we, have, we, we have some of that latency uh, that we talk about that can be a huge degrader. Um, it's just gonna be there by the law of, of, of uh, speed of light, the law of physics. So we've been talking about network, network, network. I, I think it's uh, really important to design, first of all, understand what the information you need in certain parts of the world 
understanding it exactly from a tactical perspective, I know from Coast Guard cutters, the actual tactical information they need to conduct their, their missions uh, wherever they operate is rather small compared to the administrative requirements to do um, purchasing, uh, logistics, uh, personnel support, all those sorts of things. Those applications have to be designed for that DIL environment. So whether or not you're disconnected, you have an intermittent connection or a low bandwidth connection, I mean, I, I, I don't see today a, a Coast Guard cutter oper operating out in the Pacific has one one thousandth of the connectivity I have at my home in Fairfax, Virginia. So I don't see us uh, uh, changing that rapidly, but I do see us understanding what, what's the actual information and how can I design um, uh, applications so that they can operate at that tactical edge. So uh, the fact of the matter is I will, I will forever be dependent on a uh, bent pipe for the foreseeable future. Um, and I, I think our ability to uh, understand what's the actual information we need to have while out, while operating, uh, I'll speak for myself, while, while at sea, um, and, then, and then designing for that, pushing even, even the crazy stuff, pushing AI out to the tactical edge, those are all, you know, it, it's insanity to try to approach that, thinking that I'm gonna get one gigabit per second out to a, a Coast Guard cutter um, at sea. I'll offer that. So General Reynolds talked about the information exchange requirements and, and really taking a look back at that. I think over the last uh, you know, 15, 18 years, as we've, we've been operating at war uh, in an operational environment where we had the luxury of, of total supremacy in the information uh, arena, where we could bring in all the terrestrial communications that we needed and, and had high-speed bandwidth for everything that we needed, we fell into a trap of developing our applications that, that relied on that without thinking about any constraints. And so rather than, than saying, what are our information exchange requirements and how do we meet the, the, the actual needs, like uh, Admiral Dermillion just said, um, for a particular tactical unit, it was, let's use everything we have because they'll always bring more. Well, that's not the, the, the kind of environment that we're going to operate in in a high-end fight with near-peer competitors. And so we just have to change that whole cultural mindset of what are we developing for, what are the actual requirements, and how can we satisfy those, those in the absolute minimal way in order to, uh, to ensure that we'll have some opportunity to get those information exchange requirements through. It's a really different mindset, and I need industry to help us on that um, because you know, you're, you're very comfortable with assuming that you're gonna have the high-speed bandwidth that you have at home in Fairfax, not what it's gonna be at a tactical edge. What she said. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Real quick, uh, give, if you just give me some final thoughts before we close this out, and I'll start down at the far end with uh, Lieutenant General Reynolds. Yes, th thanks, sir, and thanks again for, for the opportunity to sit up here with, with, uh, with my colleagues. I, I, you know, it's really that thought. I mean, that is the help that we need. I think it's, you know, it's gotta be slim, it's gotta be transportable, and it's gotta be done in burst, and that's all we got. That's the only time we've gotten. So, Moving forward, it's 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 helping us with that, helping us train our workforce, and uh, you know, that's that's thanks for. Thanks very much for, uh, for having me, and uh, again, like uh, Admiral Kohler said, it's great to look out in the audience and see so many of the people that, uh, that I've been working with for many, many years, and uh, I appreciate it. Um, a lot of you are in different roles than you were when, uh, when we worked together, and uh, so I really do need, when I say I need industry's help, I need your help to do those things. I need you to build in the security from the beginning, not bolt it on later. We've been saying that for such a long time, but it's becoming more and more important every day and if you're thinking about the speed to market that you need uh, to get an application or get a system out there without the security and you'll figure out the security later you are becoming my problem and and we can't use that we can't afford that and I need you to help um, drive in automation in a way that will reduce the, the complexity and the manpower requirements so that the great people that we do have are able to do the, the really high-end complex work that we need, not the mundane things over and over and over again. 
So I appreciate your help in, uh, in, in um, working towards this problem in a very different multi-domain fight. Uh, again, thank you for the opportunity to be here with all of you. Hope this was informative. Um, the cybersecurity is a is a is, is is a partner. It is a group effort. Um, we all have to hold up our end of the bargains if we're if we are going to stay ahead in this great power competition. Team fight. We're here. That's why we are here and been here for these uh, past two days. Uh, is is to do that. Uh, Navy's is moving, our, our solutions is moving to cloud-based solutions. We are looking to separate hardware and software for our solutions. Um, that's the kind of capabilities we're looking for. Uh, we think that is the way for us to be most agile and for us to, to be able to, to move ahead quickly. So uh, for solution sets we're looking for, that's what we're, that's what we're looking for, not, uh, not what we've been doing in the past. Uh, great power competition. I, I feel that we, again, we've been using that quite a bit. But we still have uh, in the Navy, in our, we'll say, in our uniform services, we have uh, 20 people with 20 years in the Navy that, that know a different kind of fight, a different kind of culture, uh, separated from a contested environment uh, in, the mar in the maritime domain. Um, I say we've been very focused in the last five years or so to change that. We still have a, a, a big chunk of our force to, to orient that direction. We are we are moving. We are definitely pointed the right direction, uh, but we are all about accelerating that. Uh, the good news is, uh, for the last five years, we've been rapidly bringing in 40,000 new people into our Navy that uh, all they know is great power competition. So I think we are getting there very quickly. Uh, thanks for your time this afternoon. Yep. So uh, my my request from from industry is, is pretty basic. Coast Guard's just beginning to migrate into the cloud, so I'd ask you to um, protect my data, um, protect your supply chain. Um, if you're dealing with Kapersky-like organization, get rid of them. Um, and if your competitor's doing that, call them out. Um, protect against insider. So I, I, I need to believe, I need to, you know, the cloud isn't the uh, this panacea, but uh, we're, gonna be, we're gonna be in that game. Um, and so I, I need to have confidence in, in the people I work for need to have confidence that our data is, uh, is going to be protected. Second thing is just uh, is uh, build to impact level four facilities and above. Uh, build it to scale and reduce cost. So because everything the Coast Guard does seems like is for official use only and then, then uh, above. And so if you do that to scale, so let's, let's not even talk about impact level two, so just build a four and above, uh, build it to scale, build to cost. And lastly, um, really su support and employ our reservists. Um, we really benefit, the Coast Guard Cyber Command uh, benefits greatly by having that. I, I bring in uh, those, those reservists that you employ. Uh, I just in, uh, broadcast that, encourage that. I, I depend uh, greatly on their, um, their experience that they have in industry, and they come back and kind of wake up, Dave. You know, this is how smart people are doing it. And then I learn, and then we, we cycle through. So please just support your reservists uh, in, in their time when they come back. Awesome. Uh, for multi-domain operations to be effective, I think the joint tactical grid could be the answer. I think we need to take a little bit of time and refine the question a little bit more uh, to make sure that we've deconstructed all the missions, get the kill chain right, um, and, and impose standards that reflect what's needed at the tactical edge. Uh, I want to thank AVSIA and Naval Institute for having me here today. Thank the audience for the great questions and thought-provoking time. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, as I, th I think about this panel before, as we close out right here, uh, I, I think something that I've seen in, in the last two weeks between here and Colorado Springs and some others is the uh, open acknowledgement that we are in phase three on the information and in the cyber challenge that's out there. And I think that's a message that needs to be brought home clearly across all of government to include state and local that was born out in this Jack Voltaic exercise I talked about. If you get a chance, go find out a little bit more about what happened and what the lessons learned coming out of that were. Um, and, and, and it impacts all of industry, government, and academia. So I would highly recommend you, you find out about that. 
And, but I think the fact that we are acknowledging now that uh, openly acknowledged by senior leaders in, in the government that uh, we're in phase three operations ought to be something that ought to alert everybody and it ought to have you on the front end of your seat leaning forward in how we, how we address that thing. I want to thank the panel. There's a lot of other things they could be doing. It was a great, it was a great panel. And uh, in behalf, you're going to take care of the book. Bob? I will. I will. And I'll turn it back over to Bob. Thank you all. Let's Thank give the panel hand. very much. Give me a hand. <laughs> certainly, certainly for the, uh, the materials they presented, but also the challenges they face. Uh, you can see we've got clear leadership concerned about uh, leveraging information, protecting information, and building the ability of information to support our forces. Multi-domain is just kind of working its way into the general consciousness. Thank you for taking on the the questions, importantly. Thank you for being here, and General Shea, thank you for leading this panel. Uh, on behalf of FC International and USNI, uh, I will make a presentation as we depart the stage. Uh, we've got a book called Fleet Tactics and Naval Operations. Uh, good plane reading on the way back or over, however it may be. We're glad we could do that. We're very glad as well that thank you, Lockheed Martin, for sponsoring uh, the panel today. Um, and for you, uh, as you leave and depart, uh, please take a moment to share your thoughts uh, on the discussion and on the event. Uh, the, on the app, it has a survey that we take very seriously as we look at the results of the work that you've done here as well. I hope to see some of you at the reception in the exhibit, exhibit hall that starts right now and back in Hall A for the morning keynote. There is a women's appreciation uh, event that is about ready to take place. I'm telling you, it's world class. It's a remarkable, affirming event. If you have a chance, find the information, and we'll see you in Hall A for that event. Tomorrow. Uh, excuse me. Yeah. Excuse me. I, want, I want to second that. It's a great opportunity to hear some great discussion and hear it from a, from a women's perspective uh, about a lot of different topics. And I think it's something you'll all enjoy. So you're all welcome, and please come. Tomorrow morning at 8.30, uh, we kick off with uh, the keynote. Uh, we're happy to have Admiral Grady with us. Commander of U.S. Fleet Forces, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the panel, and thank you again for being here.